Yeah, so there's pieces of paper all over the place. And uh, that's because it was too complicated to fit on a slide. Um, and uh, you don't need to see it because we're in a nightclub, so it's not very practical to read it right now. Um, but, uh, but you can take this home. And I'm going to hit sign up sort of the key points here. And then th th there will be sort of next steps for you if, if, you, if, if this is interesting for you by digging deeper. And also, I'll be around so you can, you can come talk to me and ask further questions about, about what's on here. But we're going to hit a few important things. The subject of this talk is how do we release the things that we actually intend to release? You know, you, we talked this morning about how important it is to build the right things in order to be positioned properly. And then Des did a really good job of hitting similar points where he was talking about, you know, the importance of focus and, and choosing which things to build and which things are the right things and, and, and the wrong things to build. But it kind of none of that really matters if you have the problem that most software companies have, which is that, like, you, you, you have this thing that you want to release, but somehow, you know, it just kind of another, another month went by and it didn't get out. Right? Is that, does anybody understand this problem? Is this <laughs> okay. So the question is, how do we actually do the stuff that we want to do and not end up doing other things? I've been at Basecamp for 15 years, and we've been doing these things that I'm talking about here the whole time um, in some form. And then we've just kind of recently started to spell it out better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little tour um, of, of the key things of how we're working, and you'll understand it without getting into every detail. Um, we're going to hit three things in particular that are really important. And then we'll take a look at a tool that we use to kind of know where we stand when we're in the midst of a project so that we actually get the thing out. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is start in this upper right area in the strategy area. And this is sort of where we started this morning, what we talked about. So the strategy is an ongoing function of the company. So this is not happening inside of a cycle. This is not happening at a certain time. It's, it's a running thing. And the situations that cause customers to buy, that's what we talked about from the demand side this morning. And then there's these other inputs, like using it ourselves or taking stories behind what our customers are asking for. And these things are informing us what matters on the demand side. So this is telling us like those key requirements that we talked about this morning. And it's also telling us sort of what are the, giving us a diagnosis of what are the things that we could be improving in terms of the actual product, right? What are the things that we should be changing? And then those are turning into what we call pitches. And uh, a few of us are, it's like our job to come up with sort of ideas for what we should build next. But also, everybody in the company is submitting pitches at different times. And a pitch is basically a write-up that says, here's a problem, here's something that's going on, and then here's our idea about, it has to include some kind of a concept or a solution for how we're actually going to like, solve it. You know? So that's a pitch. And when a pitch comes in, the default answer always to anything that comes up, no matter who it comes from, is no. No, maybe one day. Maybe one day is the, is the escape valve on it, right? So that, so that people don't feel, you know what I mean? It's like, it really means no, but we say, you know, maybe one day, okay? So, um, so no, maybe later is the default response to every single idea, no matter who it comes from anywhere, okay? All the time. So this is, a, this is something that's happening. So throughout, you know, every day, every month, every year, we're accumulating all kinds of different ideas, but these things, there's, it's not a backlog, it's not a queue, it's not some kind of a thing, burden on our back. It's just stuff that we're saying no to. So then it comes time to actually do something. And this takes us into budgeting. So we build in six-week cycles. And there's a lot of, you know, you, you say cycle, and you say iteration, and you say sprint. And these are like words that people use. You know what I mean? Uh, but it, it doesn't mean anything in terms of success. I mean, everybody's agile now, <laughs> right? But everybody has the same problems of bad morale with the, with the engineers and frustrated management and the product people. The stuff that's getting built isn't the stuff that they want to be built, right? I mean, it, nothing has gotten better, actually. So cycles alone don't help. So a couple of things I'm going to point out here are the things in the, in the, with the bold outlines. And these are the things that are really different that we do. So we put work into a cycle, and a cycle for us is six weeks. So that's, um, and a cycle includes at Basecamp two teams. Each team is one designer and two programmers. We are extremely efficient. 
We have one designer, two programs, and programmers, maybe one or two QA people. And that's an integrated team. And they're given some work to do. And when it comes to the work inside the cycle, everything that happens during that six weeks, they have a mentality that they have to expect to release what they're working on. They have to be done. This is like a sacred word for us, done. So they can't plan to get more time. If they don't get it done, it's not going to happen. This is it. It actually has to be done. So by doing this, this creates a kind of very productive pressure, right? Because if the thing actually has to happen, <laughs> like, it's not just like, oh, well, you know, I'll do another sprint, right? Or we'll do another few runs. If it actually has to happen, then they're going to have to make trade-offs. They're going to have to say, they're going to have to make decisions about how the heck are we going to pull this off, right? So this is fundamental. We're going to ship it or it's not going to happen. And our hit rate's very, very high there. I should say that this is true for about 90% of the projects that we do. And then there's the odd case where we know that what we're biting off is a little bit too big for one cycle. So then we'll do maybe two cycles back to back on the same thing. But even in that case, the work that's scoped off in the first cycle should be done and over with. And done means I don't have a subsequent integration step. I don't have more. There's, it's, it's ready to go. At a moment's notice, we could give it to a customer. That's what done means. So they have to be done. Now, if you give a team six weeks of time and you tell them they have to be done, this is a recipe for disaster. Because like, how are they actually going to pull that off? Right? And if you just say, do it, that doesn't enable it to happen. Right? So we actually have to do some things differently so that this can happen year after year after year as, as normal practice. And the, so th this, this has to do with actually thinking about how we define the work in the budgeting process. So there's two things that we've noticed over the years. The first thing we noticed may be familiar to you, which is that every time we define some work, there's always more work. <laughs> than we thought, right? So we've never had a project where the scope was the same than we thought or smaller than we thought. And every single project, the scope has been bigger than what we thought, right? Because you start to get your hands dirty, and then you discover, oh, there's this edge case. And there's also this other thing. And then if we change this, then we can't do that without changing this, and blah, 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 right? So the scope is always bigger. So even if we gave, if we gave the team uh, you know, three weeks work, worth of work, in six weeks, you know, then maybe, then maybe we'd have a shot, right, at success, because they could, they, the scope could grow by double, and then they could get something done. But it turns out that, that that wouldn't solve it alone, because even if we got the amount of scope right, we've also learned that our plans are always wrong. So every time we sort of define what the feature should be on paper, it never maps to the thing that actually works that we like in the end that we release. Now, we have, a very, we have a very good success rate when it comes to the sort of outline of the concept, right? Like the basic idea of what we're shipping, we tend to be very, very right on, because we have a lot of experience when we, when we come up with the design concepts. But the details and the specifics, they're always surprising, right? So how do we allow for this? So uh, David, uh, one of the founders, he, he has this, this quote. He, he always says, um, there's got to be some version of this idea that we can do in six weeks. This is like his slogan, and I really like it a lot. There's some version of this thing that we could do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that the budget is fixed, the scope is variable, and we're going to give the teams the power to actually figure out what that version is, which means they're going to find out kind of where's the bone and the fat and the meat, and they're going to figure out where to make cuts as they actually get involved with building the real thing. So the way that we define the work when we kick off a six-week cycle is we're not having a checklist of like these are the things that have to be hit. And we don't have like a specification or anything like that. Rather, we have a concept. So, and the concept says, here's the problem. Here's what matters about it. Here's what we understand about why we're doing it. And, here, and then here's the general outline of how we think this is going to work. So this is an example of an actual sketch that Jason drew in a, in a write-up to the, this is a formal write-up to the teams saying like, here's the concept for this thing. This was a feature we shipped last year to, to group to-dos within a list 
and adding another level of hierarchy. There's actually a lot of detail behind this. There, was a, there were a lot of mechanics that we kind of worked out in the concept, how to deal with things that are kind of not part of the list, and then you move them between, and how are you going to insert items? There's a lot of things we, we worked out. Um, but this is the level of fidelity, and there was no sense of like it has to do this and this and this and this. It was a concept. So the teams are going are gonna to deliver some version of the idea. And, um, and the scope is variable. And the other thing, the last thing that we do that's unique here, and this one I think is extremely important and maybe the most rare, which is that we could give the team the expectation they have to finish. And then we can tell the team, you have latitude to cut scope, okay? You, you have to be done, but you get to cut scope, okay? So, and we're gonna give you a reasonable concept and you're gonna figure out the details, very, very good. But then there's another problem, which is that even under those ideal conditions, if as soon as the team starts to work, somebody taps their shoulder from sales and says, hey, can you, can you, can you just work on this other thing? It's just real quick, right? Or support taps their shoulder and says, hey, you know, we just got this bug and like, we just need to track down this thing in the logs and just, can you look at that, right? Every time that happens, is time lost from the team. Every time the team gets pulled into a meeting is time lost from the team. And if we're talking about six weeks, like there's no way they're gonna be able to get anywhere if, if, if every day they're getting pulled away by other things. And you can't just tell the team, hey, be real focused on this project, right? Because this problem exists at a higher level of the organization, right? Because if, 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 the, if the engineers who are building or the designers who are working on the feature are getting pulled over by somebody from support, I mean, who, who, who like, there has to be a, a, a statement from leadership at the very top that says, we are deliberate about the way that we use our time. So the way that I wrote this here is you have to make a bet. You have to make a bet that says, we believe that if we spend six weeks on this feature, to the exclusion of everything else, including bug fixes, including other stuff that sales wants or whatever it is, right? To the exclusion of other things. Then you actually take some risk and you make the bet and then you find out after the six weeks if it was the right choice or not, right? This is really, really fundamental. So we wanna be deliberate about the allocation. If you have to deal with bugs that come up, then you can allocate time for the bugs. Right? If you have to deal with certain customer requests, then you say, we're gonna, we're gonna pause the cycle for a week and we're gonna, you, know, you can be creative, but you have to be deliberate about it. And this way the team's time is totally protected. And nobody can do that other than the leadership. Right? Protect the team's time so they can actually focus. So those are the big things I think that are different about how we are working in these cycles um, that allow us to actually ship regularly. So then the other thing that I want to show you is sort of how, how do we maintain a macro sense of where the teams stand and how do the teams reflect on where they are kind of in the actual cycle, right? Because there, it's, it's very important. You, you, you can't just start building one corner of the thing and then look up and five weeks have gone by and then, you know what I mean, and now, now you're in trouble. So we, we've been thinking about this for a while and we came up with, with a way to sort of communicate this, which is the way that a lot of people think about work, and especially the way that work tends to be estimated and planned and, and, and tracked in software companies, it is like this. There's this notion that, there's this assumption that it's kind of a labor, right? Like, well, how many story points? Or what's the velocity, right? And there's this notion that, well, if we could just kind of count up all the work and count up all the people and then do the math, then we're gonna know when it's gonna be done, right? But this is wrong because this assumes that you have certainty about the work to be done, right? So actual work looks like this. There's an uphill phase where you don't even know what the work is. And even if the work is really well defined, you say, hey, fix this bug, right? Totally clear outcome, completely clear like what, what has to be done. Once you actually get, you have to get into the code or the programmer has to get into the code to even figure out what the heck is going on that causes the bug. They can't estimate something they don't understand, right? So there's this uphill phase of figuring out what the work is. 
And then once you've actually gotten your hands dirty and you've looked at the problem and you've spiked a few things or cupcaked a few things or whatever it is, you know, you've tried some stuff, then you get to a point where you, you, can, you kind of reach the top of the hill, which is where you can see the edges of it. You're like, ah, we're going to build that, we're going to change that, we can't touch that, and then I'm going to fix that, and uh, everybody's around, and we can do this, yep, good, okay, let's do this, right? And then from there, it becomes more linear. From there, it's easier to estimate. And the risk, the character of the risk is totally different for these two worlds, for these two sides of the hill, right? Because any work that you haven't figured out even how to do or what it is, what happens if you get to the 11th hour? You can't suddenly throw more resources or, or, or put extra deadline pressure on somebody who doesn't know how to do something, right? But if you know how to do it and you've, you've figured out the problem and you understand the work, then it's like, oh, We'll throw a few more days at this, right? This is worth another, we'll, we'll stretch it for two weeks, fine. Because we know that we're dealing with certainties here and we're not just gonna get bitten by, by some sort of a, a black hole, right? Something that we can't solve. So this is a very different kind of work. So what we wanna do is we wanna know where the work stands, not in terms of 50% done or 60% done, we wanna know where the work stands in terms of uncertainty, right? So this is a tool that we built internally at Basecamp, and this is going to be released at some point, soonish. Um, and uh, this is what we use to actually track this internally. So these are to-do lists in Basecamp, and each list has a dot, and the dots are manually dragged on a hill, and the hill shows where the work stands in terms of unknown or known. So we're dragging from unknown to known and from known to done. So these things here, when I, when I just, I, I haven't been following the project, I come in, I look at what's going on, I say, ah, oh, they've solved these things. And I know what these things are, and these things that they've solved first are probably the scariest, riskiest things, right? And if they're not, then we're gonna have a conversation. And this is going to enable that conversation, right? How come these things are over the hill and those things aren't, when those are the things that we're scared about? Or those are the things that are the most untested or the most novel, right? So this is, this is how we see it. And then there's this uh, link I can click on the top that shows me a history. So this is me looking at the project over time. And I can see how they start learning. They're spiking, they're trying things out, they're learning what works, getting over the hill, right? And then climbing over. So this is real progress. This isn't labor progress. This is problem solving progress over time. And one thing I want to emphasize is that, um, so I can click on one of these, for example. I can click on this green dot, and now I see just the history of this one scope of work. And what's interesting, you should notice that the dots here, there's only one task left in this particular scope of work. So the, the dot doesn't, it's not algorithmic. It's not like when there's 10% of the tasks are left, it goes over here. This, this is manually placed by, the, by a person to indicate their understanding of how done it is. So we're using a measure of done that isn't algorithmic on a task list. This is, this is like pretty deep, you know? Like, is it done or not? Not like checklist 20%, right? So this could mean that there's a lot here, and that's why it's not at the bottom. It could mean that they anticipate a bunch of QA issues are gonna come in, but none of them are gonna be, none of them are gonna involve scary unknowns, right? Or it could also be that this is just sort of where they left off, and if I checked in the next day, I'd find that the, that the dot was down here, right? So, one more thing I wanna show you with this Hill stuff is sort of what troubleshooting looks like and how it enables us to troubleshoot. So this is a project from recently, February, and I checked in on the project and I noticed that stuff was getting done and solved, but there was this one scope that just wasn't moving. And for quite a while, for quite a few days, this scope wasn't moving at all. Notify everybody that an event was rescheduled. And we're on the uphill, which means like danger, right? If this doesn't get solved, it's not gonna happen. And time is ticking. So I pinged Scott, who was working on the feature, and uh, said, hey, man, what's going on with that? You know, like, uh, uh, is it just out of date, or what's going on? He goes, oh, uh, you know, the back end of this is done, but we found some tricky UI stuff, right? 
So, so I said, oh, well, can you just factor out the back end part? And he goes, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. This is before, this is after the conversation. So he takes this, renames it to notify of rescheduled backend, indicates that it's solved and nearly done, creates two new scopes of work, notify of reschedule, hey, this is our like inbox in Basecamp, and this they don't even know, hey, they haven't even looked at it, they don't know what they're gonna do about it, right? Totally left side. How are they gonna deal with the email templates for this? They have, they made some progress, but it's, there's still unknowns, right? This is where the thing really stands. Ah, okay, so now that we've split it apart, the thing is when separate scopes of work are identified, then you can track their movement independently. Because that's really the thing that we care about, is the movement, right? Like where, where is the progress being made? So now that these are broken out, I can see them moving independently, right? So here, they, they were, no, so notice, notice they didn't take the email thing over the hill, because they, they saw this as a risk, right? Too many unknowns, we better figure that out. Better push that up the hill further. Okay, now we've got this nearly figured out and then the amount of work wasn't too bad. So already by the next day, whew, over to the other side and we're in good shape. So those are the kind of conversations that we're able to have. We've been doing this actually for 10 years, but we didn't have the hill as a visual language for what we were doing. That's, that's fairly recent. So that's what I wanted to share with you there's a lot on the paper. These three concepts are called out. So expecting to be done, setting that expectation, protecting the team so they can actually doing it by making the bet and dedicating the resources, and shielding those resources off from anybody who steals their time, and then shipping some version, having a concept instead of a bunch of check, check boxes for what this thing needs to be so the team can actually adjust and cut scope as they go. These ideas go all the way back to Getting Real, which we wrote in 2006, but I would say this is a bit more kind of maybe fleshed out and rigorous. And uh, I also wrote a piece about this called Running in Circles that touches on the core idea of the hill and a couple things like that. So that is what I had for you. We've got a little bit of time for questions now. <laughs> Any tips for smaller teams to protect product team in a setting this, so look, there's no unavoidable whirlwind of stuff. Like, who's the boss? So whoever is the boss can do this. And if you're not the boss, then, then, this, then you have to live with a boss you don't like. Um, how do you keep track of all, is that clear? It's a decision. It's a resource allocation decision, right? So if you're the boss, you can decide what people spend their time on. It's a decision. That's why it's called deliberate resource allocation. It's really important. How do you keep track of all the ideas? We don't. Haha. <laughs> Freedom. Enjoy. OK. <laughs> How do you measure and ensure that the engineering team is as productive as it can be? I think it covered that. If the scope is variable, the incentive is to minimize it. Look, if, if, if the team is there to, to deliver something of value, that, that the people who pay them are gonna be pleased about, they're not gonna cut the bones out from the animal, they're gonna cut the fat, right? I mean, this is assuming that your team is competent and understands what they're building and why. Um, how do you measure, okay, how does the internal tool work to measure progress? If you know how far up the hill of uncertainty you are, is it really uncertainty? Now we're getting epistemological. Um, look, it's a, it's a practical question, right? How do you feel about this? Have you even looked at it? Have you cracked it open at all? Totally on the left side. Do you have a concept about how you think you're going to approach this? Then maybe 20% up, right? Have you validated your concept for how this is gonna work? And you're maybe 40% up or 50% up, or I'm losing, I don't know what percentages mean anymore. You're getting further toward the, toward the hilltop. And then if, if, if you have validated the concept and you've poked around and there's nothing else that's sort of gnawing at you like, eh, not sure about how we're gonna handle that, then you're at the top. Anybody who does development work knows what it feels like, and they, they will tell you what it feels like at each point. That's, that's sort of the why we went with uh, manually dragging, because the people who do the work, they, they know. What happens to the great idea if it's not done at the end of the sprint, is it binned? So if it doesn't happen, then uh, we generally assume that it can't happen, because we have good people. So either the concept was wrong, or maybe there was something weird that happened in terms of 
maybe we made a mistake and somebody was on vacation and we didn't know and then somehow they couldn't manage, right? It's possible that we make mistakes and something can't get done. What we do is if we get to the end of the project and the important scopes of work are over the hill, then we can feel very relaxed about investing the extra time. You know what I mean? Like, no problem, we give it another three weeks, they've solved all the problems. They know what they're doing, just needs a little more time. If we're at the end of the cycle and the thing is uphill still and hasn't gotten over, then what are we investing in? It's like we're just kind of doubling down on something we couldn't solve, right? So if that's the case, this needs more time to bake or marinate on the strategic side, on the pitch side, on the product thinking side, right? And then for morale reasons, we're not gonna like, you know, just give it immediately to a different team or something like that. You know, we'll probably, you know, keep it in the back pocket for a while. And then one day it'll come and be like, eh, maybe time to try that again, right? It hasn't happened very many times. We have Fix It Fridays. That's excellent. Yeah, we do this thing called a bug smash. Um, so that's like once in a while, a cycle will be just fixing bugs. We also have a two week cool down period in between cycles. And the two week period is a nice time to, uh, to like whatever, smash whatever you want, you know what I mean? Or fix up something that, that's been bothering you. So I think that's, I think Fix It Friday is a really good example of this deliberate resource allocation, right? You're saying like, don't bug people with, with this during the normal day, and then we've allocated a time for that. That's, that's pretty good. Um, I, I, I do think that Fix It Fridays regularly would be too disruptive. If you're working in six weeks and you lose a day, you know what I mean? Like somebody was just on the edge of figuring something out and now they have to destroy the whole house of cards that they built up and then build it again on Monday. That's very expensive. So I would, I would avoid that. I would, I would rather put these sort of fix it Friday type concepts, whatever they are, um, at the edges of the cycle instead of mixing them into the cycle. And that way the cycle is a protected, focused zone. What about refactoring? Refactoring. Well, so you, you, you know, anybody who's asking about refactoring knows that you, you refactor in order to, to build, right? You don't refactor something that's already done just to refactor it. Refactoring is a part of building something new. So that's, that's, that's just work inside of the cycle to ship something. Do you believe every project needs six weeks? No. So, um, we have, we have two things that are drawn on there. It says that the cycle is budgeted into what's called big batch and small batch. A big batch project is where we have a team who expects to use the whole six weeks on something. And small batch is where we give them like through a three or four or five like little projects that are maybe a week or two weeks each. And then they kind of fill in the six weeks as they can with those smaller things. And this is really nice because this way, if you have to cut things from scope on a previous big batch, then you can use a future small batch if you want to like add some enhancements or things that you wish you had done before, right? So that works out really well. In general, the notion of six weeks is it's not like a magic number. It's more like we want them to see that the end is in sight. This is also on there. They need to be able to see that the deadline is coming at them from day one. Because if it's not, then they're going to wait to make the trade-offs. You know what I mean? Like when, when, when you have to make the decision, you start to make the trade-offs. If you can say, uh, yeah, we're, just, we're gonna screw around for the first few weeks, and then when it starts to feel serious, then we'll, then we'll make decisions. You want it to feel like their decisions matter and impact whether they will ship or not from the beginning. And the cycle has to be short enough for that to happen. But then at the same time, if you do like a two-week cycle, everybody's, you've probably all seen that. It's just meaningless chaos, right? Because nothing can be done. It violates the done rule. So very few things meaningful can be done in a two-week cycle. So we want the minimum size where something can be done, and, uh, and then we don't want it to be so long that they can't see the end from the beginning. What are your thoughts on weekly sprints? That doesn't mean anything. Weekly sprint, it doesn't mean anything. Does infrastructure get handled with the same cycles of work? Um, so we actually have a different team that works on purely infrastructure in the sense of like there's no feature related to it. So if it's purely plumbing and it has to do with uh, performance, that's run by a different team and I can't speak to that. I'm speaking to what we would call product here, which is like changes uh, in what the customer sees and uses. How do you prioritize bugs? Bugs um, are not, bugs are, are the edges of what works. They're a natural consequence of doing anything. And every product is full of stuff that is bad that we don't like, but it needs to have a core of stuff that's good that we like. 
And uh, once in a while, a bug will pop up that's too bad, and then we will allocate time to fix it. And small batch is a pretty good mechanism for doing that. But we choose the bug. The bug doesn't choose us unless it's like something just really, really, I mean, you know what I mean? If somebody's data is disappearing down the toilet every few weeks or something, then okay, we have to, we have to solve that. But very, that, that happens very rarely. Um, I'm, I'm over time, so that's, uh, that's, that's what we could do. Yeah, so feel free to continue the conversation later. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>